Intermittent fasting and the aviation lifestyle. You may have heard some different things about it, but is it something that'll fit for you? Well, I'm excited to bring you today's show where I'm interviewing Chris and Terry Lowry, um, an airline pilot and his wife, who have a great story to share in terms of him moving around with her career while being a pilot. So that's some good stuff. But also, we're going to get into intermittent fasting, the reasons why he does it, how he works it into his day, what works for him, and some suggestions for getting started. One of the things that he shares is one of my mentors, Dr. Jason Fung. I've talked about him before. Um, He's a great resource. And make sure you go to my website, peakperformancehabits.com. You'll find my intermittent fasting guide there. It's free. Download that if you're just looking to get started because it's got a lot of great information for you to get you started. So with that, let's get into today's interview. And I can't wait for you to hear from Chris and Terry Lowry. Welcome to the Pilot Wife Podcast, your ongoing checklist for navigating your first class life as a pilot wife and aviation family. I'm your co captain, Jackie Elmer. I've been a pilot wife for over three decades, and I cannot imagine any other lifestyle. Yes, there's no doubt it's a mix of turbulence and blue skies, but what life isn't? I'm here to bring you the best that the aviation life has to offer. If you have a topic suggestion or a story to share on the show, details are at the end. And if you want the Pilot Wife Survival Guide and Checklist, go to pilotwifechecklist.com. Now, stow your baggage, strap in, and let's unpack the Pilot Wife Life. So Terry and Chris Lowry, welcome to the Pilot Wife Podcast, where we're going to talk a little bit about intermittent fasting and aviation. Wonderful. Glad to be here. Happy to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for taking the time because I know you have a busy, crazy schedule, especially right now with everything going on in the world of aviation. Um, So I I definitely appreciate it. I know you just dropped your daughter off at camp. And so it's quiet time for you guys. So we'll get through this and let you (laughs) get on about your business. So that'll be good. Thank you. Tell tell me a little bit about your background. Chris, we'll start with you as the pilot. Um, Tell us a little bit about your background, how you got into aviation and all that good stuff. Absolutely. Um, I guess I've been flying for about 15 years now, closer, Mm -hmm. probably closer to 20. Um, I uh, started later in life. I didn't start flying until I was 27. So I went to, went to college and was kind of on the uh, Tommy boy plan and uh, had a, had background in aviation in my family. Dad's a pilot. And it's kind of always something that I was interested in, but I, I wasn't properly motivated, I guess. And uh, about, about that time, when I was closing in on 27, I decided to try a, a discovery flight and uh, that was it for me. I mean, it was first time I ever uh, enjoyed studying and, and, and wanted to study and, and, uh, and was, uh, was, was good at, good at it. And, and uh, that was, that was it for me. That's kind of, that's how I started. So that was uh, back in uh, 2004 and uh, I, I did the, the whole instruction and I did some aerial survey for a year. And then I started with a, with a smaller, with a, with a regional uh, in about 2006. And I worked for them all the way through the 2008 stuff and the, the age 65 stuff and all the way through until 2015, August of 2015 is when I started my current position. And I've been there since then. Um, so when you say your dad was a pilot, was he a commercial pilot? Tell us a little bit about that. Oh, uh, yes. He, uh, well, he flew, he flew for Southwest airlines for 20 years. Prior to that, he was, he was air force for 20 years. Okay. So, and that's interesting that throughout that time, cause I'm sure that as you know, uh, and dependent, I'm sure that you flew with him, so, you know, on trips and that kind of thing, but nothing ever motivated you really to want to follow in his footsteps. Well, I, I really liked it and, you know, I'm, I'm very close to my father and I really like to make him happy. And I, I wasn't, 
I wasn't quite sure if my motivation was pure for me to do it or if, if I if I thought I was just doing it because it was the family business. So I tried everything else first. <laughs> true. Hey, you know, that's a great way to do it. It's kind of funny because I have a son who's actually in the Marine Corps and he has never expressed any interest whatsoever in following in his father's footsteps. None. And people would ask him and he would be like, no. <laughs> so it is kind of funny. Like, it's just not always the thing, you know? So I get that. Well, that's awesome. That's a great story. And how did he feel when you took the discovery flight and then when you let him know your plan? Well, he, uh, he was still flying at the time, if I recall, and he was excited, but he, he never, he never would push anything on me. But, uh, when I said, dad, you know, I think I, you know, might be interested in this. It's like, okay, well, I'll talk to this guy and he's got this plan. And you know, <laughs> we found this flight school. That's the cheapest. And it's kind of what I was, uh, making, making those steps. So he was, he was definitely excited and uh, um, it's, it's been great. We've always had, always, we have, we've always got something to talk about and uh, it's a very interesting perspective, kind of different generations in, in the industry and uh, different, different backgrounds coming at it from military versus civilian. And, you know, I don't want to say different eras, but really he kind of, he took his last flight in 04 and I started flying later that year. So wow. It's, it's well, it of, is a different era. It's a totally yeah. different era. I mean, yeah. he obviously made it post 9-11 and that right. was a different era. Mm -hmm. um, and he got out before the worst of that tenure, the, de the right. last decade. Um, but now it's just crazy. It's like the wild, wild west again. So I'm sure mm -hmm. he has some interesting perspective on the future and different things that are going on. If, if he follows aviation at all still and just the everything. He does. Yeah. But he, he very much keeps up with uh, several, several fellows and, uh, and ladies that he flew with at Southwest. And I, I think they have like an alumni page. Mm -hmm. So yeah, he, he might, definitely keeps up with it. I might have to get them on my show. Yeah, yeah, that would be if interesting. You a, if, yeah. if you could put a word in for me, I, I'm really not kidding. I think that would be kind of fun to go back, go back and visit that and talk about some of that. And then, you know, looking ahead and just even projecting into the future. It's like trying to look into a crystal ball, but that's kind yeah. of fun. Yeah. Cool. All right. So, Terry, you have a bit of a background in aviation, too, and some other stuff. So tell us about you. Uh, sure. Yeah. So I um, finished uh, an accounting bachelor's degree and a master's in HR from the University of Alabama. Um, knew I wasn't really going to go the big six accounting way at that point. Um, really was more interested in recruiting, corporate recruiting, things like that. And um, so just started applying. Um, we were we're from Austin originally. Uh, grew up there together. And so an opportunity presented itself with Southwest Airlines um, to become a corporate recruiter. It's interesting because when I went to interview for the job, um, I thought I was interviewing for in-flight recruiter and I got there and it was actually a flight ops recruiter position. And I'm thinking, I have no aviation knowledge whatsoever. And they're like, oh, that's okay. We'll teach you everything you need to know to get through, you know, interviewing, you know, from the HR perspective of it. Um, so did that for a couple of, you know, for a little while and thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, we just, Dallas wasn't the right location for us at that right at that point in time. Um, so we moved back to Alabama um, and then I got into higher education where I spent the next 15 years of my career um, in higher education, um, just working my way up to um, a campus president position with technical colleges. Um, and then that industry kind of bottomed out and uh, for the last five plus years have moved over to senior living. So now I am an executive director for um, senior living communities. So that keeps me busy. That's different. Were you in Tuscaloosa? Um, for part of it, yes. Okay. Um, and then we moved a lot with my career early on. So we went from Tuscaloosa to Florida. And that's when he, during that time, we were early on in our marriage and he decided, you know, that he wanted to pursue flying. So we actually lived apart for gosh, almost two years of our marriage early on because right. he went down to Florida to go to flight school. And, but I had a, a good job. 
um, back in Alabama. Um, but at some point in there, I was like, this isn't working, like seeing you every third weekend. <laughs> so took a job in Florida. Um, but then we realized Florida really wasn't for us. Went back to my old company. Then we they moved us from Alabama to Little Rock to Oklahoma City. Then we moved to Beaumont, Texas, and we realized very quickly Beaumont was not for us. And so we knew Houston was, we thought Houston would be a good landing pad at that point. Um, obviously with his career, what I was looking for, we we're at that point with our daughter, you know, that we said, okay, moving every three to five years, you know, she's young grade school, we need to make a decision and stay put. And we actually closed on the house we're in and eight years ago, yesterday. So yeah. this is the longest we've been anywhere. Well, congratulations. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so. so that's interesting. I love that part of it. So Chris, once you transitioned to the airlines, I'm assuming you just commuted to wherever you needed to be based on Terry's job. Right. I did. Uh, I guess 2006, we were in Little Rock. Uh, yeah, until until we moved to Houston. And then I was finally home based for about nine months and then immediately went to spirit and now I commute right now. So <laughs> got it. So well, I, was, that's I was home base for five minutes. Uh, yeah. I love it though. That's a totally different twist on the aviation lifestyle. Typically, you know, so often it's the wife relocating for domiciles and all the different transfers yeah. and uprooting her career. So I love that. And I hope everybody listening is paying attention to see that that's an option that can be done. So kudos absolutely. to you both. I love it. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. Chris, you as get a big pat he, on the back. Yeah, he absolutely supported me in my career through those years. And as long as there was an airport and I said, hey, time to move again, he, he was right there, you know, with it. So that's great. Any advice yeah. you have, Chris, for the men in that in this situation? Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it uh, comes up, you can hit on it later. Yeah, well, you know, I, mean, I was coming up, th I was coming up through the regionals as well, so I was getting to do what I love, flying airplanes, but that wasn't paying the bills either. And you know, so so she she had a great job and she had a great career and she loved it. And I knew that it was going to be later on in the trajectory for me, so that it, was, it was pretty easy. And you know, commuting hasn't been that bad. Really? So, yeah, you my, my husband points. commuted half his career. So I know right. it's, it's not ideal and it's not the end of the world either. You just right. roll exactly. with it like anything. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I agree. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about the health and wellness aspect of it as a pilot, as a family. And we'll talk a little bit about intermittent fasting. What was mm -hmm. it that led you to try and then continue with this protocol. I don't like, it's not a diet. Um, Correct. Right. it's more of a lifestyle and it's, I always sit, tell my clients and different people, it's, you know, you can't get it wrong. There are no mistakes. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do it every day, et cetera. So talk a little bit about how you found it, got into it and tell us about that. Absolutely. Um, it's kind of a, kind of convoluted. I guess many of these stories are, but, uh, I was, I just turned 40 years old. Uh, I just started with a new company and uh, I flew with this, I flew with this guy who had this book called the big book of health. And I think it's an ultra marathoner. I'm not sure, but okay. it's the big book of health. And he had something in it called the two week carb intolerance test. Um, also about this time, my brother had just gotten married. And the pictures from that wedding had just come back. <laughs> I and, know about and that. I was 270 plus pounds. Uh, you know, been a bigger guy all my life, but this was, you know, probably 40 pounds. So I looked at the scale and, and seven years of regional life, you know, eating, eating in hotels and, and, and restaurants in the parking lot and, and odd hours and odd schedules and nothing really set. It just, it just adds on every year. Uh, so this, this book intrigued me. Uh, it, it, it worked right away as far as the two week carbon tolerance test, reading about carbohydrates and kind of how they, 
how they act in the body and cutting that out for, for two weeks and, and losing a bunch of the typically it's water weight. Uh, it intrigued me and I started digging deeper and I listened to a, uh, Adam Carolla podcast a lot of times and he had a guest named Vinny Tortovich and I'd skipped over that, that podcast cause I didn't want to hear it him talking about being healthy and weight loss. But since I had kind of had my mind peaked, I went back to it and listened to it. And, and he, he talks about no sugar and no grain. I'm sure you're familiar with all these, but you can stop me anytime. Um, so that really intrigued me. I was listening to his podcast and then he later on got me into Dr. Fung. He, he, he clued me into that and that aspect of it. Uh, the first probably uh, eight to 12 weeks, I was just modulating what I was eating as far as the carbohydrates and, uh, you know, high fat, high, high protein. And I was having a lot of success, you know, 270 to 260 to 250 to 240 to, you know, 235 or so. And, and along with that, Terry came with me, you know, after, after a certain while, we didn't really change a lot at home until we kind of were both getting on the same page. Uh, I don't know exactly when it was, but at some point when I read about the, the fasting and uh, how the body repairs itself, that I kind of started getting into that. So that uh, getting, getting into that and getting more into that over, you know, a certain period of time has really, uh, really helped gone from, you know, like 12 hour fast to 16 to kind of 18. And, and kind of now what I do is more either one meal a day or, or I try to fast about 20 hours. And uh, that has me kind of, you know, 210 and below and, and, and hopefully getting below 200 is my, is my ultimate goal. So you were at 270. Is that what you said? Yeah. 270 plus it, it was, it was probably closer to 280 than it was 270. Okay. And how long ago was this? That would have, that was six years ago. Okay. Awesome. So you've done a really nice, consistent, steady weight loss and mm-hmm. you still have a little bit more to go is what I think I hear you saying. Yes. Yeah, okay. I believe so. Yes. Yeah. I love it. So Dr. Jason Fung is the one that really got me intrigued with all of that. I, I, I don't know how I got turned on to the obesity code, but somehow I did, wow. which goes into that. And then the diabetes code, it because is, my yeah. mom is diabetic and just all that. And then I just really started following him, his podcast, his Facebook group, and just went further and further with it. So when you mentioned the, the first book um, where you did the two week carbo, what, what did you call it? Carbohydrate? I believe he referred to it as a carbohydrate intolerance test. Is, okay. That's how he called it. So when you say carbohydrate and during that time, talk to us a little bit, because, you know, that's kind of a convoluted term because there's complex right. carbs and there's simple carbs. I wish they would change the name of them, honestly, so, because right. I think a lot of people get confused and they think that no carbs means all cut out all of them. Right. No broccoli, no salad, like yeah. not, you know, the good for right. you. So talk to us a little bit about what that that two yeah. weeks looked like for you in terms Certainly. of what type of carbs you cut out. Uh, during that, that step in that book, and I, I went away from it pretty quickly, but that was basically bread and potatoes and, you know, uh, pasta, anything, rice, pasta rice. rice, you know, uh, what I would consider obvious, you know, carbohydrate bombs. And I don't know if he, t- if he spoke about, oh, the phrase escapes me. Um, I'll forget it, but. Um, yeah, that was, that was basically steak and lettuce and, um, bacon and things like that, which of course was revolutionary. Like I can eat as much bacon as I want, you know, you eat when you eat until you're full. I like, felt like I learned a secret. Uh, I know but, it's uh, like, <laughs> it's like take stealing from the cookie jar only it's not a cookie. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now, um, and of course, uh, a really sad thing for me was to have to give up beer. I loved, I, I loved beer. I still do. I used to make beer. Um, so that, that was tough. Um, well, not really tough, but 
that was kind of sad to see go. It's a special occasion now. But uh, when I got when I got to the Vinnie Tortorich side of the of the scale and the and the, the no sugar, no grain, that really kind of lays it out perfectly. You don't you don't eat sugar and you don't eat grains, you know, and potatoes. Yeah, the white carbs. Right. Mostly you're those and, and the beer is more about the grain and the hops and, and that type thing. Can you do, can, or do you consume any other alcohol, wine or? I have become a, uh, a collector of bourbons. Oh, so that's, that's been a happy accident. And have, have you had Texas bourbon, TX bourbon? Um, I believe so. I believe so. Uh, most of my favorites are from uh, Kentucky, but uh, there, there is a, uh, thriving community and distilleries are popping up all over. There's, there's several in Houston I've yet to try that I need to. Well, it's funny. Uh, my, my dad is originally from Texas. My brother, uh, my dad and my brother went to school at tech, Texas tech. And my yeah, brother lived yes. there for a while. And so um, anyway, his daughter recently got married. He lives in the Phoenix area. Also I'm in Scottsdale, but his daughter recently got married. And for whatever reason, they picked that brand of bourbon TX and mm -hmm. It, my, my husband's a bourbon drinker too, and it went through the crowd like wildfire, and it's kind of become my husband's almost favorite. Yeah. And anyway, now we've turned several neighbors onto it. So since you're in Texas, I just wondered if perhaps you were familiar with that yeah. one. I, I don't have that in my collection. I'll have to, I'll have to grab a bottle of that next time I'm at the store. Yeah, and then you'll have to let me know what your what your taste Absolutely. buds tell you about it <laughs> for sure. Good. Absolutely. Okay, Terry, tell us how you segued into this lifestyle. Yeah, um, you know, I was always more of those like portion control people, right? I mean, just try to keep your portions low, exercise. But obviously, for you know, us ladies, as we continue to age, that doesn't always do the job <laughs> anymore. Um, and so, you know, obviously, as a spouse, you know you try to support each other and, you know, you want each other to be healthy and things like that. But anytime having that weight discussion is not an easy, you know, discussion to have. Um, you know, so I was real thrilled when he, you know, kind of got on this, you know, whole no sugar, no grain kick. It was definitely him at first, you know, being of course home, you know, more than 50% of the time, you know, kind of doing your own thing you know, it's kind of like, okay, are we switching off? You know, when he's home, he does his, we would, I would still cook kind of that carb side, right? The, the rice aroni, the mac and cheese, you know, especially at the time having, you know, a younger child in the house, um, you know, but eventually I saw the success he was having and said, okay, you know, I'll, I'll get on board. We'll kind of, you know, cut that option out. We were always typically, here's our protein on the plate. Here's our veggie, you know, here's that, you know, carb. Um, you know, so we just kind of started cutting that out, you know, of dinner. Thankfully, we have a child who is not a picky eater at all. We'll just How eat nice. Yes, yes. Yes. We'll pretty much eat whatever we put in front of her minus a few specific things. But, um, you know, so we really just kind of started, you know, down that avenue and, you know, had a lot of success with it. Um, you know, I will say he is much more disciplined, um, still to this day than I am, you know, um, with, you know, watching kind of what we eat, but what I have found for me with intermittent fasting, um, because I, you know, tend to still want to eat certain things. Um, for me, it's kind of like, if I don't eat at all, then I'm not tempted to eat the wrong things. Um, so that's been a big piece of um, intermittent fasting for me. It's like, okay, I'm just going to wait, you know, until dinner time, you know, to what I know we're cooking, which would be just a protein and probably a salad or Brussels sprouts or, you know, broccoli or whatever the case is for the night. Um, but I probably am more a, I tend to just listen to my body more. If I wake up in the morning and I'm hungry, you know, I'm not going to starve myself. I'll absolutely, you know, get something to eat, you know, but if I also look at what the day has in store, right? So like today we knew we'd be getting on the road around lunchtime for this, you know, two and a half hour drive. So I was like, you know what, I can skip breakfast this morning because I know we're going to probably be grabbing something not as great on the road, you know, at lunch. And so I'll just wait, you know, until then kind of had that, you know, dirty keto, you know, as we call it, Chick-fil-A, you know, filet, um, you know, and, um, you know, for, you know, that's probably, and I had some cashews on the way back, but, 
you know, that's probably going to be it for the day. So um, I fluctuate. He's much more disciplined with his consistent, you know, kind of 20 hour, one meal a day type thing. Um, I just tend to listen to what, what my body says for that day. Got it. Okay, Chris, I want to come back to you. And I want to specifically talk about it from a pilot perspective, a health perspective, because obviously you have to pass a medical and that's always a big deal. So first question is, had you experienced any challenges with your medical prior when your weight was when you were heavier? You know, actually, no, now my my blood pressure has been has had been uh, creeping up. Um, but it was still, I was still under control. I don't think I was taking medicine yet. Uh, so we, we think that's a genetic thing. My mother's always had high blood pressure and I've you know, lost 50 pounds, 60 pounds, and it's still high. So, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and I'm, I'm a lot more active than I used to be. Uh, so I haven't, I haven't had that now. I think in the intervening years is when they've started doing the, uh, the sleep apnea test and stuff like that. And I don't know what the trigger is for that. I think it, I don't know if it's a BMI or I think it's neck circumference. Some kind of neck too. circumference yeah. thing. And I still have trouble with the neck circumference, but as my AME told me that I'm just, I'm always going to have a thick neck, you know, thicker than, than what they, than, than, than what they want. I think it was a little old lady that measured her neck for the test. <laughs> but um, to answer your question, blunt, no, I mean, I'm very fortunate that I didn't have any challenges in that, in that before, before I got into it, but and I think is, I would have in a short order. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you probably did head it off at the pass. So thank goodness. Uh, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and so your flight surgeon, he's aware of what you're doing. He's aware of your intermittent fasting and. Hmm. That's a good question. I don't know if he is or not. Okay. I don't know if I've had that discussion with him actually. Which is fine. And but, one of the reasons I like to bring it up, of course, is because I'm not a medical professional. Mm-hmm. I'm not giving medical advice. So any pilots, anybody listening, this is not medical advice. We're just sharing our own stories and what mm-hmm. we've done and that type thing. Um, and obviously from a, pilot's perspective, you're passing a medical, you're doing fine. And I'm assuming right. intuitively, and which I'm going to ask you a little bit about what your typical day is, because now you're doing longer fasts, you know, started with 12 right. and now 16, 18 and 20 is kind of your target. So tell us then what a typical day, and, and by the way, anybody listening, most often you build up to that. You have to, it, and a lot of it, as, as I'm sure you'll probably concur and certainly correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of it's mindset. It's just Absolutely. working yourself right. past, oh my gosh, I'm hungry. I'm going to starve to death. Well, a lot of that's just programming. It's just habits mm-hmm. that we've developed. Absolutely. You know? mm-hmm. so, so tell us then what that typical day looks like for you on a flying day. So you commute. I do. Are you do. typically same day commuter? Yes. Most, okay. most of the time I am. Um, I just tend to kind of roll roll through all days the same for the most part. And then I just kind of fit in what I'm eating or what I'm going to eat with where I am. Uh, I use an, I use an app on my phone to kind of keep track of when I start and, and when I finish, uh, can I say what it is? Sure. It's the, the zero app. Okay. They have a, they have a free side and a paid side. I only use the free side and another pilot, uh, keep me into that actually. But I will, you know, start my fast and say we finish, you know, eating at a certain time. And then uh, it will say, you know, I have it set for 20 hours and it will say, you know, so, you know, 20 hours will be at 1.30 in the afternoon. Okay, well, I'm going to finish getting, finish packing my things and and get ready for for to go on the trip. Uh, I will head out typically on, we'll we'll say I have a, you know, 11 a.m. show in Orlando and I'm going to be on a 6 a.m. flight. That's, that's pretty easy at that point to make it to 1.30 because you're, you're sleeping for half of it. And then you're on the, on, you're on the, on the airplane commuting, you're drinking coffee and you're getting ready for the flight and you've got all this, 
um, to take a step back, I do, I do pack a, a, a lunchbox and take it with me. And if nothing else, I will have in there a bunch of protein, whether that's uh, hard boiled eggs or, you know, hamburger patties or whatever other, you know, whatever wonderful meal she's cooked uh, during the week that we have leftovers of and maybe some veggies, you know, uh, maybe some pork rinds, you know, something, something crunchy like that. Uh, and I'll have that in a lunchbox with me. So when I do decide to eat, whenever that is, if that's, you know, that cruise on the flight deck, if I'm hungry, uh, or I may just, I may just roll it on in to the overnight and eat when I get to my room. Or maybe I'll save it and go out with the FO and have a steak or something. So it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it can be different every time, but there's just kind of, kind of these, uh, guidelines or bumpers, if that makes sense. Yeah. It sounds like you have a plan and you follow it. I mean, right. A good, right. a good checklist will get you through <laughs> a lot of different things. And so when you, I mean, and I think that's a big part of it is planning ahead. So what I hear is you're not ever really without food. So if you get derailed right. because of delayed flights or whether, you know, whatever it could be, you're going to basically be okay. I'll have, I'll have something there that I can, yeah. If, if I need to eat, it's not going to be a burrito. Right. So, so I'm gathering that because you started this six years ago or so through the P word, I hate to say it, I'm sorry, I'm just so sick of the last two and a half years, but when there was so much chaos and still there, there still is to some extent, like restaurants mm-hmm. still aren't fully open. And I know I go through airport terminals all the time and, you know, this one's still closed and the lines are still crazy and all that. Mm-hmm. I'm guessing that didn't really affect you too negatively because you were prepared. Am I wrong about that? No, I don't guess so. Mm-mm. Yeah. And I, I didn't, you know, there were a lot of guys that took uh, low flying and no flying lines or, or took time off and stayed home. I, I pretty much flew my regular schedule and yeah, for the most part I was okay. Yeah. There were a lot less choices out there. I, I will typically, you know, eat out with the crew at least a couple of times during, during a, a four day or a three day. Uh, but uh and there were less options during that time, but I, I did always have, you know, my, my, my lunch kit with me with, uh, with proteins in it. So yeah, I could always, could always eat. Yeah. Is that, what would you say in your experience in the last two and a half years or so, what's the percentage of people who do pack meals? Roughly. That's a good question. It's le- it's it's way less than fifty percent. Yeah, you know, it's uh, I, I would say probably uh, twenty to to thirty five or forty percent of, of of people I see, and that's that's split between both sides. Yeah, uh, a lot. I see a I see a lot of uh, flight attendants that pack their own their own meals. Uh, a much greater percentage, I would say. Yeah, that's funny. I'm one of those passengers that packs mine. Same thing. If I'm, <laughs> even for you. a couple of days, I just figure it out because my health and what I eat is just really, really important to me. So, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Very good. Um, any Along these six years or so, has anything ever upset the apple cart? Have you ever gotten derailed? Did you fall off for a while? Or has it just really been a steady thing for you? I'm a rock and I don't ever make any mistakes. No. Um, <laughs> I want to be you when I grow up, (laughs) (laughs) you know, sugar being sugar and carbohydrates being essentially an addictive drug. um, It's, it's kind of progressive. You know, we go on vacation and it starts with a a dessert and then maybe the next day you'll have a piece of bread and, and dessert also. And then, a waffle and then you know it's just it, it it goes it goes fast and I notice it very quickly on on my body and uh, one of the greatest things about about uh, no sugar no grain and the intermittent fasting is the keeping down of inflammation uh, I've you know got old joints and bones I've, I've got a, a bone 
a spur in my right foot. And when the inflammation kicks off, I can feel it in my foot right away. And it, and it takes a couple of days or more uh, of, of eating well and doing what I'm supposed to be doing to get that inflammation down to where I'm not popping ibuprofen all the time. So um, that helps, that helps me, helps me know when I've gone too far one way or the other, but you know, I'm, I'm always going to have a a slice of cake on my birthday or, or something. I don't want to derail anybody's, anybody's party, but uh, the knowledge of what that does to me and Derail, that I'm derailing myself has kind of helped me in the last six years to know when it's when it's time to to slam on the brakes. If that makes sense, it does. And I, for me, that's been probably the most powerful thing about the whole process is. And and you hear this, but when you're at the very start, it's hard to believe it sometimes. But mm-hmm. your body will tell you. It, it's very intuitive. And once you rid it of a lot of those things that that it's fighting, even if you're not aware of it, like you know, the carbs and the excess of insulin and all the different things that do create that inflammation. Mm -hmm. Once that goes away and you start feeling good and then you do derail it by, you know, something that you've done and you pay the price, it doesn't take that long to get, to pick yourself back up because you want to feel good again. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But I love what you're saying. I mean, yes. And, and I love that it's not about depriving yourself that, and especially, you know, I'm all about making a conscious intentional choice. I'm having birthday cake tonight, or I'm having that extra glass of Mm -hmm. wine, or I'm doing whatever. And I'm doing this knowing that I'm doing it. And so tomorrow I'm going to pick up and, you know, maybe do something a little differently, or I'm going to, you know, take care of my body in a different way to alleviate because I have the inflammation issue to some extent Mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. But it is, it's amazing. It's like, there's a freedom around it. A lot of people think it's depriving, but really there's a freedom Mm -hmm. of knowing what you can do. Right. Yeah. Good. Awesome. Um, so how do you guys handle it at home? Do you cook together? How does your daughter, do you, um, does she, I I know you said she's a great eater and that type thing. So have you pretty much incorporated, especially when you're home, Chris, do you guys, what, what's your kitchen and your cooking and all that? Like, Yeah, yeah, I would say from my perspective, since we've gone this way, he's definitely gotten more involved in cooking, you know, um, just because I guess it's, on one hand, simpler, you know, because you're just always cooking some protein. And, you know, for us, salad's a big, you know, go to side, you know, salad with a whole bunch of veggies, uh, you know, avocado cut up on it, that type of thing. Um, so yeah, definitely for me, he's definitely picked up more, you know, he's, he's gotten into grilling, so smoking a lot of meats, you know, things like that. Um, yeah, so yeah, I mean, when I'm when when I'm home, typically, I'll in your in your working. She right. she works obviously in a, a full schedule. Um, we'll we will plan out the week. Yeah, we always plan out, out our meals week. for the week. Um, yeah, it's usually a, a protein and a veggie. Um, you know, Rebecca still does eat, eat. She gets plenty of carbs. You know. Yeah, um, we've definitely talked about trying to you know cut and and you know, we try to make healthier choices for her, you know, so for her, you know, um, you know, a Greek yogurt, you know, for dessert, um, you know, something like that. If, um, you know, in my job, I've got, um, access to, you know, a lot of food from work I can bring home desserts every day, you know, and if I bring something, we'll try to cut it in half, you know, where she's only getting half of the portion, you know, things like that. Um, so we've definitely seen, um, some positive changes in cutting out a lot of those Mm -hmm. carbs for her. She has a seizure disorder and, um, you know, we sense a lot of people don't know, but for the keto diet was originally actually, um, designed to help control seizure management. And yeah. And so since we've kind of gone to this lifestyle, we've actually seen a drastic decrease in her seizure activity. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, because we don't cook her anything different. I mean, she, you know, when she, eats she, she, yeah, she eats what we, you know, b- besides maybe adding, you know, something else for her onto the plate, she eats, you know, what we eat. So. Was but, there? Yeah, typically, sorry. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, typically 
you know, when I'm home, I'll, I'll execute the plan for the week, you know, and she, she'll, she'll go to the grocery store on the weekends and, you know, kind of plan it out and go from there, yeah. you know, and we, we will go out, you know, probably at least once, yeah. once a week or so, but, you know, with, with knowing what, what you eat and, and what you can do to yourself if you're not careful, you know, you, I really don't have any problem ordering from the menu in, in most places. Well, I find today with gluten free and yeah, with all of the different food allergies and stuff, Mm -hmm. they're just totally equipped these days to, you know, whether it's gluten free, whatever the option is, um, or keto, you know, I mean, I see more and more of that even on the menu. Here's the keto menu or Yeah. yeah, that type thing. So it does make it easier. Did you have certain things that you just started eliminating? And in that, where I'm kind of going back to your daughter, because I know that there are a lot of families that listen. And that's one of the biggest things is, oh, my gosh, my kids are going to have a fit if I cut out the mac and cheese and some of that. So talk to us a little bit about how any of that went, or maybe it's not relevant. Um, You know, again, I think just because she is a, you know, pretty good eater and we don't have to worry about it. She just, you know, um, yeah, (laughs) you know, she, for her, she, you know, we use a lot of collie rice. Mm -hmm. Um, and she doesn't know that that's not rice. Um, you know, spaghetti squash. Yeah. We substitute spaghetti squash for pasta. You know, we make, we make spaghetti squash with marinara and we do, boil like a a, little little small amount of pasta for her sometimes to to let her to let her have that so as far as like but that's a small modification yeah but she you know again she's a a a very good eater yeah not not picky at all yeah it's it's actually this past weekend he was of course gone flying and you know i was asking her saturday night typically if if it's just her and I on a weekend night, you know, I'm like, okay, you know, I'm not going to cook up. We've cooked all week. So, you know, what do you want? And she's like, I want Chinese food, which that's not something we eat anymore. Right. And so I was kind of surprised. I was like, really? She's like, yes. So I was like, okay. You know, I mean, again, for, you know, she's a kid, she's active. She goes, you know, um, you know, anything in moderation, you know, in my opinion for a child, as long as you teach them moderation and, they're active. Um, you know, would we like to move her, you know, away from, you know, even some of the sugar and carbs she gets? Yes. But it's also a little bit, you know, it's hard, you know, with everything that's out there in, in school and, you know, going, you know, to hang out with friends and activities. So we just try to, you know, limit it as much as we can. So it's funny though, when you model it at home, I, I have found anyway, that's what I found with my own children who are grown now, but the more you model it and don't come down super hard and, you know, just like a hammer on them, they slowly adapt to that. They just yeah. do, you know, yeah. and especially she'll, when you talk about it from a healthy mind. perspective. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, she'll go grab berries and apple oh, yeah. before she'll grab any, you know, out of, the, you know. Out of the pantry that we might have in there that's more junk food. I mean, she'll, you know, we'll have to actually say, okay, that's enough raspberries. Like, don't finish <laughs> like, the whole cart tonight. Those are not cheap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, we don't really have much to, you know, no, worry really about. Don't. So, we really don't. It's so, usually, you know, from the school, we're a little junk food. Yes, so, exactly. You know, I throw away stuff all the time. But yeah. You don't need M&Ms. Yes. Yeah, it's true. When she's not that, looking. Yeah. That's, I, yeah, I, I know all about that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what are holidays and special occasions like? And what I mean by that, I know we talked about, you know, if it's somebody's birthday or whatever, you're going to have the cake or you're on vacation. But holidays specifically, and some of our more traditional holidays, um, have you adapted much with that or talk about that? I mean, I'm thinking Thanksgiving most specifically yeah. like with stuffing and I've, you know potatoes and all the, we've done it kind of both ways. Uh, we moved my, my parents to town a couple of years ago when we've had, I guess, three now, three Thanksgivings. I think one, we just went full out. Um, and then one, we, we went really kind of no sugar, no grain. And the other was kind of a hybrid 
Um, we always I, try. Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving, I'm going to have yams. So <laughs> that is, that's what's going to happen on Thanksgiving for me. But mom and dad will have the stuffing there for whoever wants it. The turkey will be there for whoever wants it. We're always going to have the green beans. And then the rest of it will be what you want. You know, do you want the cranberry sauce? Do you want, right. do you want this, that, or the other? So basically have all the options there. And then, you know, we've got a really good uh, keto bakery that we like here in Houston that uh, nice. we've used for, uh, we've used for birthday cakes yeah. and pecan pies. And, and of course that's still got, you know, sugar alcohol in it. And it's, but it's, it's better than, you know, it's, a, it's still a treat, but it's not, you know, snicker bar. That makes sense. Sure. Yeah. So I think we, I mean, our, our families know that we do this, you know, and for the most part, they are supportive and, yeah. you know, and actually both my mom, who, um, a couple of years ago is, um, diagnosed as diabetic and then his parents, um, you know, have seen us and, and, you know, they're, you know, 70 plus all of them, you know, so a little bit more set in their ways, but I think as they've seen us and especially him have all the success, you know, they've kind of gotten on board and, you know, are more careful. Like, you know, when they're coming over his parents, you know, and he's, you know, grilled out a, you know, a brisket, smoked a brisket, you know, if they're not bringing in the potato salad anymore, you know, instead right. they typically bring the green salad, you know, um, and we'll make deviled eggs. Deviled eggs you know, things like that. So, um, they, you know, they understand it and for the most part support it, you know, and kind of help. I mean, yeah, Thanksgiving and some holidays, you know, they'll have a little bit more for, you know, for the entire crowd that's at the dinner table, but we always, we always make sure, you know, that we bring stuff that, um, we feel, you know, that we can eat, you know, and, and feel like we're not losing out on anything. Yep. but still trying to stay as close mm-hmm. to what, you know, how we eat on a day-to-day basis. And then those are even the days that we pay more attention to the intermittent fasting, right? Like right, if we absolutely. know we're going to have this huge dinner, you know, we will make sure we fast throughout the day. So, you know, if we do, you know, indulge in some of those, you know, little treats here and there, um, you know, for us making sure we stay in ketosis is important. So we try to, you know, kind of go, okay, you know, let's, level the playing field by not eating all day long. Right. Let, let's just save it all for dinner. And so, yeah, I find Thanksgiving to be the easiest, especially if you eat not at noon, but not at night, you know, a little later in yeah. the afternoon, oh, yeah, absolutely. that's it for the day. Like who needs right. more. Right. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. I do have to tell you, I absolutely perfected gravy this past Thanksgiving with tapioca flour. Oh, okay. Really? I'm just going to tell you that if you want my recipe, I'll send it to you. (laughs) But it's kind of funny because I've done it several times, you know, and and this year I started early. It's I I cheated. I I had a huge gathering at my house and I had to make two turkeys. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to do it like the resorts do. So the day before I cooked one turkey and then the next day I cooked the second one. So I got the first one all carved up and beautiful. And I took all the drippings and everything and I experimented and tried with the gravy and tried with the, I had two different flowers and I tried with the tapioca flour. And I am telling you, it was amazing. amazing. Nobody okay. had a clue. I didn't even say anything. A lot of times I'll make two gravies. I didn't this time. It was so good. <laughs> That's another great way to do it. If you ever have a big crowd, cook the first turkey the day before and, and, you know, not all the way done, but just enough. And that ended up being perfect. That was a great way to do it. And it was stress-free, but <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. Another story. Yeah. Um, so other than obviously the weight loss and the inflammation, um, anything else that you've experienced? He stopped snoring. Absolutely. He stopped yeah. snoring. <laughs> <laughs> so better sleep for you, Terry. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Both, I think both of us actually. Oh, yeah. I mean, we definitely just, you know, have much better, you know, sleep, um, you know, and just the energy. I mean, everything's better. Yeah. I mean, you know, for him, you know, I think a big piece of it, you know, again, as you continue to age, especially being in the senior living business, what I see is when um, people lose their mobility. The minute you lose your mobility, your quality of life goes down drastically. And so, um, you know, when you don't have that excess weight on you, you're able to move so much easier. So, you know, he um, now, you know, not only from a weight 
management perspective, but also just from a move management, you know, he's really good about making sure he, you know, gets his steps in every day, you know, whether it's at home on the treadmill, or if he's, you know, obviously overnighting, he's always out, you know, walking in some city, you know, um, sometimes I'm like, oh, that, that, okay, but <laughs> let's, let's yeah, let's yeah. Yeah, stay more in the, <laughs> you know, um, but yeah, so I think that's a big piece of it too, just keeping that mobility. So you do feel good from, you know, head to toe. It's kind of funny how one healthy habit does beget another one. Absolutely. You know, almost without even thinking about it. I, I know, I don't remember how many years, it's been about four years ago. I had to, I was in a coaching program and I had to make one personal goal commitment that was kind of a health thing. And I committed to 10,000 steps a day, mm-hmm. like an average. And I've kept with that. But it was so funny because once I did that, well, I would come back from my walk and it was like, well, all right, I'm going to eat something really healthy because I just did this long walk and, you know, whatever. And I'm going to feed my body yeah. well. Yeah. And then it was like, well, gosh, I'm going to put an extra 15 minutes and do some weights. And then it was, you know, just one thing after another. And I I did not consciously decide to do any of that. Mm -hmm. It was just those little slight edge habit shifts that we start making that lead us to go, oh, well, that wasn't so bad. What if I did this too? You know? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So any advice for somebody uh, wanting to start this, where would you, how would you start them? Besides my intermittent fasting guide at peakperformancehabits.com, but we'll, we'll get to that okay. later. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, that uh, almost, uh, well, I'll tell you this. Uh, the VinnyTortorich.com, he's, he's got a PDF on his website that I actually have, you know, on my, on my phone if we get to talking about it on the flight deck and I can share that with him. And it has kind of a list of all the, of all the things that you can eat and a little, a little rundown on him. Are you familiar with Benny Tortorich? I am not. That's a name I haven't heard. So please make sure I get that and I'll put it in the show notes. Absolutely. Um, it's a, it's a, a wonderful piece of literature and it's great to refer back to. It's all the stuff you, you know, should not eat and, and all the secret names for sugar that they hide on and garbage at the grocery store. Um, and just kind of a great little, a little kickstart and, and it's kind of motivational at the same time. So I, I, that's, that's what I, what I will do. Um, failing that, you know, that, that two week test, you know, it, it's all, everybody's kind of kind of come to it from their, from their own angle a little bit. And I think, um, you know, you can kind of give some information, but it's, it's hard to, it's hard to push. Now, if somebody asked me for, for my advice on how to start, you know, I would, I would give them that PDF and tell them not to eat sugar and, and not to eat bread. <laughs> you know, it really is that simple. Yeah. yeah. I think for, I think you just have to decide what, you know, it, I think if somebody's trying to start changing their complete diet and intermittent fasting at the same time, it might be tough. Might be tough. So I think it, it's, you know, trying to decide what your end goals are. Um, and, you know, for some people it's starting with intermittent fasting, it might be easier to start with yeah. intermittent fasting. you know, where, Hey, just start 12 hours. Right. Breakfast. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's such a mentality that we've lived with that breakfast is the most important meal of the day, yeah, you, said that. you know, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm so uh, glad you know that. It's so funny. Yeah. It's like, you know, something told repeatedly over time becomes the truth for all of us. And it's like, well, yeah. where is that scientifically proven? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, um, you know, just telling people to try it, you know, and it doesn't have to be every day of the week, you know, start three days a week, you know, um, I'm not a coffee drinker. He's a huge coffee drinker, you know, so I know for some people that's, you know, kind of their, you know, starting point, like, you know, maybe just have that extra cup of coffee if that's what you need, uh, you know, yes, you know, but try those kind of things. And I think you'd be surprised, you know, if you, especially if you're eating a good solid, you know, satisfying meal as your last meal, you know, making sure you're, you're getting that protein, that fat in there, that's going to satisfy you, you know, till that next meal, um, you know, it, it really is not as hard as 
you think it is like you've mentioned it, it's a it's it's a mental, it's thing, a mental like thing yeah it absolutely is because we're just so used to being told you know either three meals a day or six small meals a day whoever you've listened to is your last you know nutrition coach you know type thing um so it, it, it's you know it, you just have to find what works for you absolutely well, Chris, Terry, thank you guys so much. You've been a wealth of knowledge. It's, it's fun to see how this has worked out for you. I'm thrilled that you're doing it as a family. That's exciting. I love that your daughter's a willing partner along with it, almost without even realizing yeah. what you know is going on. So I think that's going to be encouraging for a lot of families too, who are thinking, oh my gosh, am I going to become a short order cook, you know, making stuff for everybody. Um, but thank you. You've shared so much great information. Any final thoughts? <laughs> I don't skip I, breakfast tomorrow. Start with that. That's a great suggestion. All right. Well, thank you both for being here and we'll stay in touch and hear how yeah, everything's absolutely. going. And I know that the aviation and other communities who listen in are going to get a lot of value out of this. So I appreciate your time. Not a problem. Thank right. you. You have thank a good you. evening. Thanks. You Take too. Care. Bye. Bye. All right. Just a reminder again, you can go to peakperformancehabits.com download my intermittent fasting guide, give it a try for yourself. We shared a lot of good information here. And I hopefully one of the biggest things that you took away is to make it easy on yourself to begin with, start with the 12, 12. Don't try to take on too much at once. Don't try to totally um, give up the foods that you've eaten before and restrict your eating window and do this and work out and all of that. That's the biggest reason why so many people fail at their new year's resolutions. They try to do too much too soon. So get the guide, go to peakperformancehabits.com, download the guide, go through it, and just start to begin to make those simple slight edge hacks and habit changes that are going to set you up for success. I am a mindset and peak performance coach, so I work mostly with women to help them rediscover their own sense of identity and purpose and create that better flight plan, avoid that turbulence, and put their own oxygen mask on first. So if you are interested in having a discussion with someone who's been a pilot wife for over 33 years, navigating thousands of miles and moments of life in aviation, along with mommyhood and business, schedule a call with me. Go to coach.pilotwifepodcast.com. Thanks for listening. If you like what you're hearing on the show, grab the Pilot Wife Checklist at pilotwifechecklist.com. And if you have a topic suggestion or a story to share on the show, go to ask.pilotwifepodcast.com. Share the show with any pilot wives, military wives, or anyone in aviation you know who might share and benefit from this similar experience. I'll see you on the journey.